It says, but the word of God spread and multiplied. After they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, taking along John, who was called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit set, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. God, we ask that your Spirit would speak that there would be a prophetic voice in your church from your word this morning. God, that we would be conformed to the image of your son. We love you. We praise you. We bless you. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, worship team. Oh, nothing like the doxology to get it going, huh? Boy, I think that kind of says it all. Well, uh, we are continuing in our series, The Relentless Gospel, uh, Acts and the Unstoppable Mission of God. And today we're going to be looking at Barnabas and Paul, set apart by the Holy Spirit for mission. Now, last week, uh, the last time we saw Barnabas and Paul, they were being commissioned. And they were being commissioned to take a very generous offering from the Antioch Church way up north. And they were being sent down to the Judean church to deliver that aid to this struggling congregation. Meanwhile, the Apostle James is killed, taken off the board by Herod Agrippa I. And Herod Agrippa I sees that this pleases the Jews, particularly the Pharisees. And so he arrests Peter in like manner, intending to do the same thing to Peter, and then God, as we saw last week, Pastor Patrick did a marvelous job to show us how God set Peter free miraculously by an angelic messenger, several miracles going on there. And, in, and then Peter shows up at the gate of the home where Christians are gathered in mass to pray for him. And no one believes that God has answered their prayer. It's just a marvelous story. And so then they are convinced, then Peter has to convince them, yes, it's true. He goes in, and from that moment forward, in the book of Acts, Peter will pass off the scene. Peter goes off of the scene, and he's no longer the prominent leader, at least the focus of the book of Acts, and now the focus of the book of Acts is going to be increasingly the ministry of Paul from Tarsus, the apostle Paul. And so now the story circles back. The story circles back, and Paul and Barnabas, who had delivered this aid to the Judean church, they're now going back up to Antioch to report what God has done. And so we see in the story that the Spirit of God has used lots of means to accomplish his will. In the book of Acts, God has used lots of means. He used festivals, holidays, heavenly signs and wonders, tongues, Visions, dreams, persecution, and now he speaks directly by the Spirit to this community of prophets and teachers in Antioch to transition the mission increasingly toward the Gentile world, particularly Greeks and Romans. So there are several foundational principles in this story present in these five verses, and we need to pay attention to them today, so let's take a few moments to unpack them. The first one that I think I see here. Chapter 12, verse 24, is that generosity is part of the church's mission. Generosity, the church's generosity, is part of our God-given mission in grace. Verse 24 says, but the word of God spread and multiplied. And after they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, taking along John, who was called Mark. Now, the word that Luke uses for relief mission here is actually the Greek word from which we get the word deacon. And it's the Greek word diakonia. Another word is diakonos. And that word means a service rendered, ministry. We translate it sometimes ministry. Uh, but it can also mean an act of worshipful service. So it is either an act of service that someone renders to you, or it is an act of worshipful service that's in devotion to the Lord. 
And so this term is used, for example, in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, when the apostles have to say to the rest of the church, listen, God has not called us to wait tables. God has called us to the ministry of prayer and the worshipful service of presenting the word. Now, we don't tend to think of that as part of our worship, but it really is. So what is our mission? Daniel mentioned it at the, at the top of the worship service. I want to put it up on the screen for you. I want you to see it because this is the key. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus who gather to worship God in spirit and in truth. Full stop. This is what we're called to do. This is what a church is. A church is a gathering. A church is not a scattering. A church is an assembly. The word church means assembly. And so God has called us to make disciples who assemble, to worship the one true God in spirit and in truth, in ways that are worthy of him, and from the heart empowered by the Holy Spirit, who grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to emulate Jesus' mercy, his compassion, his grace, and we want to become as biblically and theologically literate as we can. So we want to know a lot about Jesus, and we want to look just like Jesus, emulating his grace toward others. And then we're also called to go back out into the world proclaiming the good news, making disciples. So that's our vision. That's the kind of church we want to build here. That's the kind of church God has called us to build. Now, in that vision or mission statement is the key to practicing generosity. I want to show it to you. Practicing generosity is one of the ways in which we worship. It's one of the ways in which we fulfill the first pillar of that mission. We worship God as we are as a congregation, practicing generosity to others. And it also inspires the worship of others. When you and I show the generosity of the gospel of grace, it inspires the worship of others. One of my favorite stories is John chapter 12. John chapter 12 is right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, in John chapter 11, he has raised Lazarus bodily from the dead, a man who was sealed in a tomb for four days, four days. Jesus has risen him bodily with a word telling him to just come out of the grave, and he did. And so in chapter 12, they are throwing a big shindig for Jesus. It's a swanky party, and Jesus is the guest of honor. Obviously, he would be. And people are there to to pay deference, to, to show him deference, to pay him honor. And Mary, young Mary, who always gets in trouble, but she comes in and she's got this, this uh, very expensive perfume. Now, it's translated perfume, but it really is an oil. It's an aromatic oil, and it's really hard to get. And so it's very rare. And she has about 300 denarii uh, worth the expense of this was equal to 300 denarii. Now, 300 denarii is 6,000 bucks. That's what it translates to in our economy. But that was a year's wages in, for the average Jew in that, that culture. So she comes in and breaks the top off of this thing, like hammers the top off, and then pours it onto Jesus' feet and then dries his feet with her hair. And the scent of that aromatic oil fills the home where they are all sent, uh, sitting. And Judas, the Grinch Iscariot, <laughs> objects to this. He says, why didn't we sell this? We could have given the proceeds to the poor. And then John adds the editorial comment, he didn't care about the poor. <laughs> Judas didn't care about the poor. John says, we found out later that he had been skimming from the till the whole time. He'd been dipping his hand into the money purse, embezzling. Can you imagine embezzling money from Jesus of Nazareth? Not a good plan. Now, what is ironic about this fact, the fact that she extravagantly gives this act of worship to the Lord, which looks very wasteful on the outside, the fact that she gives 300 denarii worth is contrast to to Judas later who betrays Jesus for 30 Roman silver coins, which would be the equivalent of 150 denarii. So he betrays Jesus for half as much. This guy's a snake. Listen, an extravagant, heartfelt gift given to Jesus, given to the glory and the honor of the Lord, is never a waste. 
I know, folks, I know there are people. I've had them tell me in no uncertain terms that they love our church, they love our church family, they love the ministry, but they just feel like coming here on a Sunday morning is a waste of their weekend. And listen, I'm here to tell you, no, it isn't. The hour and a half or two hours that it takes you to get here and be here and go home and fellowship with the family, it may seem like that two hours is a lot to give to God in your week, but it's not. Folks, any gift that you give the Lord, no matter how wasteful it seems to the glory and honor of Jesus, is worth it. And the Corinthian Christians, for all the flack that they get for being a bunch of yahoos, and of course they are, (laughs) in many ways, but not in the area of giving. In the area of giving, they outdid everyone in the ancient world. And Paul takes note of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is one of the funniest, but I just find it very humorous. Because what Paul does, he starts that passage out by saying, uh, oh, the gift that I took from you, which he mentions in 1 Corinthians 16. He says, the gift that I came and picked up and then delivered to this church that was hurting and going through a hard time that you supplied their needs. He says, man, guess what? Macedonia got wind of it. The church is in Macedonia, and they want to outdo you. And then he basically says, I want you to outdo them. I mean, I want you to get competitive about your spirit of generosity. And so Paul is making a good case for this. But here's what he says in chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. He says, "Uh, you will be enriched in him in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, that is, as we deliver your gifts to the rest of the body of Christ, it will result in thanksgiving to God. There's worship. There's worship. There's worship. The service, now here's that word again, diakonia, the worshipful service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. There it is again, worship. Because of the service, diakonias, by which you have provided, uh, proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. He's just saying two things in this passage. There's two things tucked down in here. The first thing that he's saying is your giving, your act of generosity to supply the needs of a hurting a wing of the body of Christ. Your act of generosity was an act of worshipful service. That's the way God saw it. He saw it the way Jesus saw Mary's gift of breaking that perfume bottle and offering it to Jesus. And it has resulted in the thanksgiving and praise of others. Others have lifted up their praise to God because of what you did. And he says, this is proof that the gospel is true among you. And so we need to understand that practicing generosity as a church is one of the ways in which we worship God, and it's a major way in which we inspire the worship and praise of others. Next, practicing generosity grows grows us up spiritually. Well, if we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, which is the second pillar in that mission statement, that vision statement, if we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus, we must practice the generosity of the gospel of grace. Voluntary, cheerful, lavish giving cures me of selfishness. It cures me of worshiping myself and having all things brought to be sacrificed to me. Right? My desire for things cannot, cannot have a grip on me if I'm apt to share those things. My desire for stuff cannot get its talons into me if I, as a tendency, give those things away. And it inoculates me. It inoculates me from the viral self-indulgence that is prevalent in our, com- in our community, in our culture. Now watch what Paul says here in verse 10. He says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply increase for your resources and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I first read that and I thought, what am I reading here? How can your righteousness be enlarged. I mean, how can you grow in righteousness? Aren't you already justified? Now, here's the difference between justification and sanctification. I'm going to tell you the difference. Justification, okay, we're Protestants here, so this is what we believe the Scripture teaches. Justification is the legal, forensic declaration that you are in the right. 
You stand in God's courtroom, accused, and the news is bad. The evidence is good against you, and the truth is, you're guilty as sin. You and I stand in God's courtroom, guilty, and God declares us not guilty, or God declares us pardoned for the guilt and for the sin. Now, what justifies God's decision to declare us pardoned? What justifies it? Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone. So you and I are declared in the right, not because of our rightness, but because of the rightness of one who has come forward to say that I am taking the punishment, I am taking the, their blame, and I am giving them, imputing to them, my righteousness. And now when God looks at you, he sees Jesus, or he sees Jesus' effort. He sees Jesus' obedience. He sees Jesus' righteousness. So that's justification. Sanctification is a little bit different. Sanctification is the working out of that justification, is the working out of that rightness in the mix of your life. Sanctification is to be formed into the image of Jesus of Nazareth, his character. So what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, when he's saying that they're enlarging their capacity for righteousness, it's not righteousness for salvation, it's functional, practical righteousness. It's the righteousness of God in Christ that is now working out in your life. You see, he who knew no sin became sin. That is, he became a sin offering so that we might become the righteousness of God. There's an exchange there. And in becoming the righteousness of God, positionally, we now functionally, practically, every day, work it out into our lives, right? And now the key to this is their application of the generous spirit of the gospel. They have been generous to provide for other churches who are in desperate need and undergoing famine. And he says, this is what God is going to do in response. He's going to increase your resources and also enlarge your capacity to grow in righteousness. And by the way, Corinthians, you really need that. So practicing generosity loosens the grip that my stuff can have on me. And by that, God can increase the harvest of my righteousness growing in the rightness of Jesus Christ. And practicing generosity also helps us make inroads into our culture and our community. It's one of the ways in which we show the world and show the church that the gospel has taken hold here. When individuals give to the work of God's kingdom and his gospel, that is an act of worship. When individuals in the church give generously to Jesus for his glory, that is one of the ways in which God is glorified and we worship him and it inspires the faith and, glory and worship of others. But it's also one of the major ways in which we make inroads into our culture, into our community. Look at Acts 2, 44 through 47. It says, now all the believers were together and held all things in common. And they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day, what was the result? The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now notice a couple things going on here. They're gathering and no sooner in Acts chapter 2 is the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, poured out on his church and people are filled, deluged with the Holy Spirit, the transforming presence of God, their first instinct is to be generous because God by nature is a giver. God is a giver. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out on that congregation, their instinct is to give their instinct is to meet the needs of all who are needy, right? So I love this passage. Practicing generosity helps me to make inroads into my culture, into the community. When people see it, when the community sees that generosity in the gospel, they will take note. And what a refreshing alternative to the materialism and self-worship that has bound our culture and our community, isn't it? Isn't that refreshing? To know that we could be a part of a community like this, like Christ Community Church, where people give generously to the work of God for the furthering of the gospel, praise God. So back to Acts 12, 24. But the word of God spread and multiplied, and after 
uh, and they had completed their relief mission, their act, their worshipful act of service to deliver this generous gift from Antioch, Barnabas and Saul returned back from Jerusalem. The generosity of the gospel is part of our mission in the gospel. Number two, God builds the church through diversity and leadership. God builds the church through diversity and leadership. The second thing that we see in this passage is quite clear. Verse two, it says, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Now what is going on here? What is going on here? This is a team, Luke tells us, of prophets and teachers. And in this passage, he tells us who the prophets and the teachers are. I want to show you who they are. And it looks for all the world that he's very intentional about telling us that the gospel is moving forward into the world and God is causing the leadership to be socially and ethnically diverse. Look at who these people are. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is the way that God builds the church the way that God builds the church is through a, uh, a diversity of giftings. So that's the first way he builds the church. He has lots of functions, uh, leadership functions that, that bless the church. Here it is in Ephesians 4. This is what he says, verses 11 through 14. He says, and he himself, God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Until we all reach the unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ's fullness. In other words, Christ is the stature. He is the standard. He's the measuring rod. And we are all growing together. So in context here, he's talking about the body of Christ that is the temple of God. God is building his new temple, Ephesians 2, out of Jews who are saved and Gentiles who are saved. And he's brought these two warring houses together. He's, de he's broken, he's demolished the dividing line, the dividing wall between them, and now has brought them together as one people in Jesus Christ. And he's building up this body, this holy temple, this building unto the Lord. And here's how he's doing it, through a diversity of leadership gifts. Now, in Ephesians 4, that's what it's about. It's about the diversity of leadership gifts. But in Acts chapter 13, it's more about the diversity of the leaders themselves, socially and ethnically. Who are these people? Well, Barnabas, as we learned a few weeks ago, was a bilingual Jewish Levite. He was a bilingual Jewish Levite. He could speak Greek. He could speak Hebrew, probably Aramaic. So he may have been trilingual there. And he also is a Levite, so he was trained to be a priest. So this guy now knows the Old Testament. He knows the sacrificial system. He knows how Jesus has brought it to its intended completion and fulfilled it. And now he's just an ideal teacher to translate it to Greek culture. So you have a Jewish Levite. You also have Shimon or Simeon, which was a very common name in Judea, Palestine, and North Africa. His nickname is Niger which comes from the Latin word, which means the black. Uh, this would be the equivalent of calling him Simon the African American. <laughs> Except back then it would be Simon the North African black man. That's, it wasn't offensive, it was just a designation. And then you have Lucius. Well, who is Lucius? We, we translate it Lucius. It's not his name. His name is Lucius. Another very common name in the ancient world, he's, a Cyrene. he's from Cyrene, which is modern-day Libya, a very prosperous Roman state. Uh, most of the people who lived there were Arabs. So some scholars believe strongly that he was probably Arabic in descent, in terms of his human descent. And what about Menachem? Menachem. Now, it comes over in Greek from Hebrew uh, as Menachem. And we just translate it Manan, right? Because <laughs> we don't say things like that. But his name is Menachem. And now he was a close friend of Herod Antipas from childhood. Remember, Herod Antipas is the one who had John the Baptist's head cut off. And he also opposed Jesus' ministry. Jesus called him that fox. And so this likely refers to a freedman status. He likely was a slave. What we know from history is that a tetrarch in training, that is a prince coming up, his closest friends usually were the slaves, his playmates, who were his slaves that lived on the compound. 
And so it, scholars believe that Menachem was a Jewish slave who was the best friend of Herod, Antipas. And as soon as they came of age and Herod was in charge, he set him free. So now what is going on here? Luke wants you to see this. Luke wants you to see that the leadership of the church is moving increasingly. The gospel is moving increasingly towards socially and racially diverse leadership. This is the direction the gospel is moving. It's not moving back to Jerusalem. It's moving out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utter parts of the earth. So Antioch is led by a racially and socially diverse group of leaders who are instrumental in building up the body of Christ through what? Instruction and prophetic direction. Antioch is being led by racially and socially diverse group of leaders who are instrumental in building up God's holy temple, building up God's holy body of Christ through instruction and prophetic direction. We'll come back to this. So God speaks to this diverse group of leaders through corporate worship and fasting, the spiritual practices of devotion. Let's look at this. So corporate worship and fasting can be a means of spiritual preparation for a new direction. Corporate worship and fasting can be a means of spiritual preparation for a new direction. So it says, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, now we don't know how the Holy Spirit said, probably came through one of the prophets there, probably as a result of what what theologians call internal cognition, that is God impressing his mind on your mind and then you speaking his mind, something like that, probably. But the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after that, they had fasted and prayed. They lay hands on them and they sent them off. Now the term worshiping here is the term from which we get the word liturgy. It's uh, the word liturgeo or liturgeo. And it, it means to render sacrificial service. Render sacrificial service. If you lived in the ancient world and you said to an ancient person, hey, I'm going to worship, the first thought in their mind is, Where, where's your animal? Where's the animal that you're going to slaughter <laughs> on the altar? That's how they think of worship. And so in the Old Testament, you have all of these sacrifices Right? All of these sacrifices that are required, the bull sacrifice, you've got the lamb sacrifice, the pigeons. I mean, there's, you're burning grain, you're doing all these sacrifices. And in the New Testament, we find out what? That Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that sacrificial system, totally, fully. He's brought it to its intended completion. He's filled it full. He's filled it up. And Jesus Christ now fulfills it. And now how does the New Testament speak about sacrifice? We bring the sacrifice of praise. That's Hebrews 13, 15. We bring the sacrifice of praise. Romans chapter 12. Submit your body to God as a reasonable act of worship. Submit your body wholly like a sacrifice to God, right? And so in the New Testament, we find that submitting sacrifices to the Lord has become spiritualized. It really has become a spiritual practice. And this is one of the ways we do it. It's fasting. Fasting. Now, fasting, for those of you who have wondered about this, literally means to go hungry. It means to go without. It is a word that describes a designated period of time in which a person intentionally forgoes meals and then focuses their spiritual attention, their focus, their energy, and their prayer on God. So we're not told in Scripture how to fast. We're not told in Scripture how long to fast. It's really very open But I want to fill in some blanks here. After many years of studying this and practicing this, I want to give you some keys to fasting as a spiritual discipline, as a mode of worship, of offering your body as a living sacrifice. First of all, fasting and worship and prayer can help us eliminate distractions. Just like we are here today, we are in this room, we are worshiping God by singing, giving our attention to the word, serving one another through our fellowship. Why? Because we're here to fast focus on God. And so it can be a way to eliminate distractions. And the issue of becoming distracted by the pressing concerns and the pressures and problems that come in and out of our lives was so important to Jesus that he gave one of his most important parables about it. It's in Matthew chapter 13. It's the parable of the sower. And in the parable of the sower, Jesus says this. He says, a farmer goes out to sow his seed. He goes out to scatter the seed. And as he does, he scatters it on several different kinds of ground. 
You've got the really impenetrable, hard, compressed ground that won't even receive it. And you've got this other seed over here that's perfect ground and produces the harvest perfectly, just awesomely. But in between here, you've got this really kind of ground that looks like it's healthy, but there's a bunch of rocks underneath. So the roots can't grow deep, and, it, and the plant, when it comes up, is scorched and withered. And then you've got this other soil that also looks healthy, but there's a bunch of weeds in there. And Jesus calls this the distracted soil. And this is the soil in which the gospel goes into the heart, takes root, begins to grow, but then because it is so distracted by the cares and the worries of this life, it does not produce the kingdom's fruit, right? And this is what the discipline of worship and fasting can do for us. The discipline of worship and fasting can help us to avoid those distractions and discipline us to get before God and seek his will and seek his face. It's just an excellent, excellent discipline. And then fasting and prayer also helps us build up a resistance to sinful impulses. I believe this is one of the ways in which God trains us. Fasting and prayer and worship combined with worship can also train us to resist ungodly, sinful impulses. And so I'm using this res word resistance in two senses. The first sense is in strengthening a weak immune system. We experience limited exposure to the very things we need to resist and to prevail against. So I'll give you an illustration of this, my little boys. My little boys, when they were little, for a while, you know, for a couple years, for a few years, I thought I was a really bad father because they would come in every day covered in dirt. I mean, covered in dirt because my boys in particular like to go out in the backyard and explore the backyard. <laughs> they would go out into the backyard and turn over every rock and then I would have to put everything back the way I had it. I would find stuff where it wasn't supposed to be and they would come in and I would give them at bath time. They would have dirt in places that I didn't know it was possible to get dirt. Dirt up their nose, dirt in their ear canals, dirt up in their teeth. I'm like, did you eat the dirt? <laughs> you know, just dirt in their fingernails, just grubby. They'd have to scrub them down, soap them down. And for a while, a couple years, I just thought, I I'm the worst father ever. I'm not keeping my children away from all this nasty dirt. It turns out I was wrong. Dirt is good for them. It's good for you. This is a scientific fact. I want you to get this book. Jack Gilbert, for those of you who have little boys, please get this book. Jack Gilbert, who's a PhD scientist who studies micro, microbial ecosystems at the University of Chicago, and he's the author of the book, Dirt is Good. Dirt is Good, the advantage of germs for your child's developing immune system. And here's what he found. His research focuses on early exposure to limited levels of bacteria and microbes in dirt, and he's found that it can actually boost your immune system while also triggering serotonin, which is that relaxation chemical, anti-stress chemical in your brain. Early and repeated exposure to dirt in children led to increased levels of resistance to parasites, viruses, bacteria, harmful bacteria in later years. And a well-exercised immune system needs to be given the chance, he found, to experience moderate levels of dirt. That's how you grow. By contrast, I had a friend uh, named Bev who grew up in a house where her mom bleached the walls every day. She told us the story. We were like, what? She was so scared of her kids getting any viruses or any germs, she bleached the walls in the house, the baseboard. She bleached them all. And Bev had one of the worst immune systems as an adult as you've ever seen. You see, you need some limited exposure to the things that come into your life to challenge your faith because if you don't ever have that, you never grow. Your spiritual immune system just stays weak. And this is part, partly how, when we fast and when we pray, this is just my theory, it's partly how we open ourselves up and become vulnerable to the very thing that we're trying to fight against. Next, fasting and prayer. Uh, it's also a resistance in the sense of physical conditioning. And I like this analogy because the New Testament uses this analogy several times. It helps us to get spiritually ripped ready for action. 
Now, everything in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 3, when Jesus was tempted, when he was fasting and praying in the wilderness for 40 days, everything Satan offers him is something that is a natural desire, something perfectly natural for him to desire, and this is how Satan does it. He offers you something you actually need or you actually want. This is what he does. A few years ago, I joined uh, Planet Fitness, and I noticed on Mondays when I was there that... um, when I got there to work out, there was this table, a couple tables on the side, and they were stacked with pizza boxes and bagels, and like cream, just big tubs of cream cheese. And so about the third time, uh, on the third Monday, I walked by one of those tables, one of the workers was there just cleaning, and I said, hey, can I ask you a question? And I, I just channeled my inner Seinfeld. I said, what's the deal with the pizza and the bagels? And she said, oh, every Monday is Pizza Monday. And I just said, don't, don't you think that's why I'm here? <laughs> that's why I'm here. Because Monday through Saturday is pizza ba- and bagel Monday through Saturday. Okay, I did not come to the gym to eat pizza and bagels. I came to the gym because I ate pizza and bagels. <laughs> and I have come here to devote myself in this time to kind of offset that. Listen, this is what the regular practice of spiritual disciplines and fasting and prayer and worship, this is what it does for us. This discipline not only inoculates us from the viral stuff out there in our culture by strengthening our our immune system, but it also helps us to condition ourselves so that we are ready. When Jesus is in that desert, the strange thing about him being there in Matthew chapter 4 is that he has now opened himself up. He's actually more vulnerable to temptation. And this is exactly what Satan does. Listen, in the valley of the shadow of death, God has prepared a table for you. He's prepared a table for you, but so has Satan. And it's a table of pizza and bagels. It's a carbolicious table. It, it, is, it is a table in which he wants to entice you and tempt you toward the things that in of themselves, they may be perfectly natural desires. But listen, I don't want anything that God wants for me from the devil. I don't want anything that God wants from me given on the timing, on the schedule, the calendar, and by the hand of Satan. And that's the reason why Jesus rejects it. That's the reason why he resists temptation. And so when does a legitimate desire become sinful? Well, then, when we don't receive it on God's schedule and from his hand. So Jesus was there to condition himself, to build up a resistance, and so must we. You see, the leadership team in Antioch, the prophets, the teachers... This socially and racially uh, diverse group of men, this ethnically diverse group of people who are leading the church there, they are there denying themselves in an environment of worship, creating an environment in which the distractions are gone and they can hear the Spirit. Let me ask you, some of, this, this won't, some of you this won't apply, but let me ask you, are you in the throes, in the midst of a decision Is there something impending, something coming up, and you need God's wisdom, you need the Spirit's help to make that decision? Would you devote yourself to prayer and fasting and worship so you can get rid of the distractions and hear the voice of the Lord? So let's draw out some application today. First one is this. Let's pray and seek the Spirit's direction for opportunities for gospel generosity. Well, no sooner had I written that, typed it up, and somebody sent me an email which is a need of one of the churches that we sponsor, one of the the missions uh, that we sponsor as a church, and it's around the world. And this particular mission around the world, they're experiencing horrific persecution. And they're also trying to start a little seminary so that they can train indigenous pastors in that culture and raise them up out of the soil of their own society. And it's wonderful, it's amazing, but it's going to cost them $10,000 to start that. And I sent that on to Vic Pearson, who's their, our elder chair, and I said, hey, can we send this on to the missions team and, and get some buy-in here? I, I, I want to see what everybody thinks of this. And so over the next few weeks, we don't know whether God is going to lead us to do it or not do it, but I think this is the generosity that the gospel expresses itself in, right? So be praying, be praying. How can Christ Community Church be a blessing to churches around the world, our brothers and sisters in other places? How can we demonstrate and prove the genuineness of the gospel? Number two, let's continue and embrace the idea of diversity and leadership. This is just the way the gospel is moving. 
the way the gospel is moving. Now I want to say two things. We don't do diversity for diversity's sake. Diversity is not a virtue in of itself. It's a virtue because God sovereignly wills it. So we don't seek diversity for diversity's sake, but this is the way the Spirit is moving. This is the way the Spirit is moving, is to get people who are from different backgrounds and different educational backgrounds and and experiences and different ethnicities in the same room together to lead the church. I'm telling you, this is the way the Spirit is moving. So let's continue to embrace that. Number three, let's devote ourselves personally and corporately to worship and fasting as we seek the Lord's direction. Again, do you have something that you need to seek the Lord for today? Well, call on him. Set aside some time. Fast and pray. Let's, let's pray. And invite the worship team to come back up. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for the challenge of this passage. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to us by the Holy Spirit through it. Thank you for helping us to see very clearly what your intention is, what your plan is. And God, you have, you have led the church in the direction to penetrate deeper and deeper into the world, the cultures of the world, so that we can evangelize, reach more with the gospel of Jesus. Would you open our eyes to ways that we can do that and show the generosity of the gospel? Will you give us, give us kind of a spirit leading in that direction. And if you're here this morning and there's a dec- you're in the moment of decision, you're in the valley of decision and right now you just need the spirit's help. Will you devote yourself? Would you just say, "Yes, Father, I just I want to hear your wisdom and your direction. Would you give us your direction?" And God will do it. If you ask, he gives wisdom generously. So ask him for it now. And God, we can we commit ourselves to the discipline of worship and prayer, and fasting, and gathering, and fellowship, so that we may hear you clearly, so that we may know your voice as your sheep. In Jesus' name, amen.